Well, as they say, follow that. Uh, the the build-up can be rather greater than perhaps what you uh, get, and uh, you may feel that you've been led astray by Amber Walder by the time you've heard me. Um, listening to, to Sam and to, to Bill and their mention of the American Declaration of Independence, and Sam said he felt nervous about mentioning such a declaration in the presence of a British parliamentarian, but I can put you at ease because John Carroll, who was a signatory, of course, to the declaration, went to the school in England where I am a school governor. It's also the school where my own children uh, have been educated as well. So I have quite a lot of sympathy for the American Declaration of Independence, <laughs> not least because, as Ronald Reagan once said, he said, the American Declaration of Independence is a covenant with the whole world, a covenant with the whole world. So what we're doing here today is renewing that covenant. It's an Anglo-American meeting in some ways, but it's a, a meeting also for the whole world. The values we share, the values that come in that declaration, well, where did they spring from in the first place? Of course, in the book of Genesis, in the opening book of the Bible, it says that every one of us, regardless of color or class or creed, or orientation, or gender, or ability, that we are all, man and woman, we are all made in the image of God, imago Dei. And that is the starting point in this debate. It's the end of the debate once you've said it, because as we've been reminded by this powerful team of speakers with whom I'm incredibly proud to share this platform today. Being pro-life means being human, pro-human rights, and being pro-human rights must surely mean being pro-life. Marie ended her remarks by reminding us of the third part of that equation, which is about human dignity. And I want, if I may, to just base my remarks today to you around those three questions about human rights, about human life, and about human dignity. Wherever we live in the world, there's an undeniable and intrinsic connection between those three things, and they must always be seen together. When rights are exercised in a vacuum, it is catastrophic for the weak and for the vulnerable. It was G.K. Chesterton who said that to admire mere choice is to refuse to choose. Freedom for the pike can become death for the minnow, and we have to decide on whose side we stand. Globally, abortion has become the most lethal weapon of mass destruction. Unborn children are hunted down in their millions, often in poorer countries, as we've heard, under pressure from Western nations. As the story of Chen Guan Cheng illustrates, this can also involve the mass destruction and the abuse of women, as well as the killing of their children on an industrial scale. Perhaps the story of this blind man will at last open the eyes of the world to the enormity of what it is that we permit, both in our own nations and export or aid and abet in others. Yesterday I had the chance of sitting with Congressman Chris Smith, for whom I've had a huge admiration, along with other members of Congress over the years, but sitting with Chris and with Reggie Littlejohn, who's been mentioned already from the platform. And we watched a short film that will be released later in the year by Shadow Line Films. And we reflected that it's a cruel paradox that those who say they stand for women's rights have ushered in a culture of gender side and sex selection, where the three words, it's a girl, have become the deadliest words in the world. Mm. It's a girl should lead to the destruction of 200 million missing women. It's a girl should lead to child kidnapping and human trafficking and to distorted population balances. It has led to social engineering and to men who become bare branches. And that is why these three ideas of human rights, human dignity, and human life stand together. Let's think about human rights for a moment. And the Great Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, which came in the aftermath of a Holocaust which had taken the lives of six million people. And in there it states quite categorically that everyone has the right to life. Article 3, everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of person. And yet, what life had people endured? What death had they endured? Remember the camps. Remember the destruction that had taken place. The people, because of their racial origins or their orientation 
or their political or their religious descent. It is, this is what it led to, but not just in Nazi Germany, but in other parts of the world where people forgot that the most basic right of all, from the womb to the tomb, is the right to life itself. It's our Jewish chief rabbi in Britain, Lord Sachs, Jonathan Sachs, one of the great religious men in the world today, who said, don't ask where was God at Auschwitz. Ask where was man. Don't ask where was God at Auschwitz. Ask where was man. We all need to ask ourselves that question as well. Where are we in the context of this mass destruction of life that takes place in our world today? Mm -hmm. The UN Special Rapporteur, who was in charge of uh, human rights issues in North Korea, Professor Vitip Munterporn, talked about some of the atrocious policies being pursued there, and amongst the policies that he mentioned was the forced abortion of little babies in the wombs of mothers who were returned from China as refugees, people trying to escape from the country. And as we've been told already today, to put those words forced and abortion together, perhaps this tells us all we know about some of the regimes uh, that we know about in the world today. I first met Yu Sang Jun some years ago through Jubilee Campaign and Christian Solidarity Worldwide when he came to Westminster. He'd seen his wife and two children die in North Korea. His other boy was lost as he tried to get out of the country. And he said to me that we must stand together in the cause of human rights and human life. It's one of the reasons why I vis then visited North Korea, as you've heard, but it's also one of the reasons why I helped to create the Parliamentary Committee on North Korean issues in the British Parliament, because these issues stand together. This young man, Shin John Hock, wrote the book Escape from Camp 14. He was in DC recently. He was my guest in London as well. And we've stood on platforms together around the world. He was tortured uh, in Camp 14. But he also saw his mother and his brother executed in that camp from which he escaped. The only person to be born in a camp and to escape from North Korea and to be able to tell his story. He sees the inextricable link between human rights and human life and human dignity. Or Jean Yonok, who gave evidence to my committee in Westminster and described how Christians in North Korea were denied food and sleep and they were forced to stick out their tongues and iron was pushed into it and she went on to describe the terrible degradations that had occurred and she described how women had been forcibly aborted because they came back bearing a Chinese child having uh, themselves been made pregnant while they were trying to seek work in uh, in, in, in neighbouring China in order to send money back to feed their own families. Someone who died en route out in the river, in the river Yalu, trying to, to leave North Korea. And that's inside one of the only permitted churches uh, in North Korea with my colleague, the redoubtable Baroness Cox, Caroline Cox. Barbara Demick, in her book Nothing to Envy, sets out the situation very graphically. So... I wanted to introduce my remarks by referring first to human rights because, as you heard, human rights and human life stand together. And I get pretty angry when people try to caricature those of us who care about the right to life of the child in the womb by implying that somehow we only care about life between conception and birth and not at any other stage. That is a caricature, it isn't true, and we must refute it because we do believe that these three themes of rights, life and dignity hold together. These are photographs I've taken in different parts of the world where I've, I've travelled. Uh, I was with Congressman Joe Pitts yesterday, uh, with whom I travelled on behalf of Jubilee Campaign to visit the refugee camps on the Burma border. This child in the corner photograph here is a Karen child, where hundreds of thousands of people have, been died, have died in the Karen state in Burma over the years. Last week I was privileged to be with Aung San Suu Kyi when she visited the Westminster Parliament. We're beginning to see some beginnings of change perhaps in that part of the world. I was the first parliamentarian to go into Darfur. 200,000 people killed, 2 million displaced. In South Sudan, 2 million people killed by an aerial bombing campaign by Khartoum, their only crime to be Christians. And even now, while we're meeting today, a new genocide, the second genocide of the 21st century, is unfolding in South Kordofan and Blue Nile. This is about the right to life as well. 
But, as Dr. Alveda King said, when she came to speak to my committee in the British Parliament, she said the greatest human rights struggle today, uh, following in the footsteps of her uncle's civil rights movement and in the footsteps of William Wilberforce in his great battle against slavery, is the pro-life movement. And she herself talks about how disastrous it was for her to have had three abortions in her own life. We need people to change their minds. We don't need condemnation and judgment. We need to understand that we have been sold a lie by the great deceiver. And it's propaganda that is pouring into people's minds, telling them that somehow they're better off without children. It's better off to have an abortion. But somehow they won't be able to live their lives if they have a child. We have to confront that lie, as she has done. You heard in the introduction from Anne that I battled on behalf of the human embryo. I am scandalized that in my country that we have permitted in the United Kingdom more than two million human embryos to be created and then destroyed or experimented upon. What do the leading embryologists say? These quotations on the screen, I won't read them all. What do they say? Life begins at conception. No one disputes that. Science tells us that. You don't have to be religious to believe that. But what we then allow is just appalling. Nature magazine said your world was shaped in the first 24 hours after conception. That is when you began to be you. There's no other watershed benchmark that you can look to and say, that is when my life started. So that is why, from the moment of conception, we uphold life. But yet what we permit are things like the animal-human embryos that Amber Walder referred to a few moments ago, the creation of animal-human hybrids, the mixing of animal and human genetic matter. Why on earth would we want to do that? What possible scientific purpose, let alone ethical uh, purpose, can this possibly serve? One estimate is that there are currently over 80 therapies and around 300 clinical trials underway using adult stem cells. There is no need to create embryonic stem cells. That's not even where the cures are, even if it were ethical. It is not necessary to do the things we do. And it was Professor Shinya Yamanaka in Japan who said, and I don't know whether he has any religious convictions or not, it's irrelevant. He said, when I saw the embryo, I suddenly realized there was such a small difference between it and my daughter. I thought, we can't keep destroying embryos for our research. There must be another way. And it was he who found the way of running adult stem cells backwards so they would be pluripotent, so they would have the capacity, the vigor that a human embryonic stem cell has, and that they wouldn't, of course, be rejected uh, because they are not uh, from somebody else. That other tiny embryo is a somebody else. They are from you. So it was good science, and it was good ethics as well. C.S. Lewis, in his great book, uh, That Hideous Strength, part of the Cosmic Trilogy, talks about how Lord Feverston, who's the head of an institute called the National Institute for Coordinated Experiments, decides that what we've got to do is modify the human race. And ultimately, he says, we'll create a new type of man. Well, the fiction, written back in the 1940s, has become a reality in our day and age. And where are the voices being raised against this? Dietrich Bonhoeffer said that destruction of the embryo... Uh, in the mother's womb. In the mother's womb. I'm sorry that I can't see the script very well from, from here. He said it was murder to take the life of the human embryo. That is what Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who gave his life for human rights and human life, who was executed uh, by uh, Hitler's Nazis. That's what he said, and he was right. Um, the coming peril, if we permit the continuation of experiments on human embryos, the manipulation of human clones and the rest, this will mean that we will end up with people eyeing your genes with envy. It will mean that we will be practicing eugenics of the same kind that was practiced on adults during that uh, period I've just referred to. Let's turn for a moment to abortion. Uh, there are 42 million abortions annually throughout the world, 115,000 every day. In my own country, in Britain, it's 600 every single day. And as you saw before in those words of President Clinton, the same things were said in Britain, but it would be rare and it would only be used in certain circumstances. It's allowed up to and even during birth on a baby with a disability. It isn't defined what the disability will be, so it can be and has been anything from cleft palate or club foot to hair lip 
or to Down syndrome or spina bifida. If that isn't eugenics, if that isn't discrimination, what is? Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, I've given the figures here over last year, rare, nearly 200,000 uh, abortions in Britain. And I recently, just in the last month, produced figures in Parliament, and that's why you're right to ensure that you have data that can be relied upon and can be cited and properly used in the debate. I was able to produce figures that showed that just three teenagers, three young girls between them, had had 24 legal abortions. And this was publicly funded through our National Health Service. Bear that in mind in the context of a debate you're having in this country at the moment about publicly funded health care. 2,290 abortions on grounds of disability. They were performed just last year, and 147 of those were after 24 weeks gestation on some of the grounds that I've just given you. This is the reality of what we do. And yet the pain that is involved, and I know that Chris Smith is thinking of legislation to tackle the issue of the pain felt by the unborn child, it is undeniable. Uh, and if you care to look at some of these slides in more detail later on, you can see the quotes from uh, people like uh, Professor Anand, who is one of the leading uh, experts on fetal pain and who advises against uh, abortions, uh, certainly in the uh, third trimester, um, where pain becomes a, a real factor. Um, there's also, of course, uh, the damage that abortion does to women, whether it's psychological or physical, and there's data that people should examine far more carefully than they have about the potential linkage with issues like breast cancer. Um, the issue of, of, of the psychological damage has been examined by the Royal College of Psychiatry, and some studies indicated no evidence, it's true, of harm, whilst other studies identified a range of mental disorders following abortion. That was a paper that was released in 2008. Let's at least have an empirically based argument about these things with looking at the data that is available. And let's go back to Roe versus Wade, who has been referred to already in the course of these proceedings. Norma McCorvey, the real name, came to Westminster at my invitation where she spoke and explained why and how she had been manipulated and used uh, by the abortion rights lobby at the time and why she has changed her mind and is now one of the most important pro-life advocates uh, in the world today. And there are alternatives. In Britain last year, there were just 70 babies available for adoption. We abort 600 every day. 70 last year, babies, newborn babies available for adoption. We abort 600 every day. Alternatives also, just in the last day, in fact, Chris and I were talking about it yesterday, there was a story of a baby operated on in utero and a tumour removed from the baby's mouth successfully. Uh, this had never been done before in this particular circumstances. In this case that I'm showing you on the screen now is a baby, of course, who had spina bifida, and there's the baby holding his brother who had the same complaint and was operated on as well. So you don't need to take a child's life. Let's use good science, good medicine with good ethics to provide solutions like this, rejoicing in life. Pope John Paul said that a nation that kills its own children is a nation without hope. A nation without hope. Well, if we need a new covenant with the world, maybe that's the covenant that we need today, is to provide hope to the world. Archbishop Rowan Williams, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, says it's impossible to view abortion as anything other than the deliberate termination of a human life. And Jonathan Sachs, moral issues like abortion and euthanasia, which had always been subject to an overriding sense of the sacredness or otherness or givenness of life, are now reduced to property rights, the right to freely uh, dispose of whatever one owns from a fetus to a life, the British chief rabbi. And Mother Teresa of Calcutta, life, she said, is being deliberately destroyed by war, by violence, by abortion. And I've often said, and I'm sure of it, that the greatest destroyer of peace in the world today is abortion. And she says that, she said that life is the most beautiful gift from <coughs> God. So the intrinsic link then between rights, between life and human dignity. And gender side, it's been referred to already. The Economist magazine put it at 100 million. Others think it's as many as 200 million. Behind every single one of these statistics is a life, and one life too many. In the 
Case of China, 117 boys born now for every 100 girls. That's 35 million more males. 70,000 children stolen annually. Female suicide, the highest in the world. Is it any wonder that China has the highest suicide rate? When you hear about the stories that have been referred to today, the things that we do to women in that kind of situation, this is the photograph that was referred to earlier on of this extraordinary uh, woman in Shaanxi province who was beaten and dragged into a vehicle by a group of family planning officials while her husband was out working. This is not a million years ago. This is in June this year. She was aborted at seven months gestation and her baby was left beside her on the bed. How can we treat people in this kind of way? And how can we remain silent about such appalling atrocities? Or this story of Jim Yanni, who was again held down by five officials injected with saline solution. And this story, which is one that was first given, in fact, to Chris's congressional committee, Chris Smith's congressional committee, in which I have cited in the British Parliament, of Mrs. Zhao, who was an official inside one of the abortion clinics. And she described having escaped from China and come to the United States. She said a baby of nine months gestation had poison injected into its skull and the child died and was thrown into a trash can. Where here is human life, where here is human dignity, where here are human rights. 21 million sterilizations, 18 million IUDs, 14 million abortions in one year alone. And we in Britain, we've never suspended the program. All political parties in Britain, Conservative, Labour, Liberal Democrat, all of them have supported this one-child policy where it's criminal to become pregnant where it's illegal to have a brother or a sister funded, aided and abetted through British taxpayers' money. We've never suspended that program. It's gone on year after year after year after year through IPPF and UNFPA pouring money into the Chinese Population Association. And yes, Cheng Wan Cheng, who spent four years in prison as a direct consequence of exposing how in Shandong province more than 120,000 women uh, had been forcibly aborted. And for telling the truth, for speaking out, this man who has become, some have referred to him like uh, Shawshank in Shawshank's Redemption, a blind man who then escapes from the house arrest that he's under, makes his way, falls into the river, and is driven uh, to the American embassy in Beijing, and finally is now here in the United States. But he has altered the destiny of 1.3 billion people, China, is one of the great nations in the world. Its people are some of the greatest people I've ever encountered. But they could allow or tolerate this in their midst, though, is an offence to humanity and something that is wholly uncivilised and something that must change. And when it does, we can say it was as a result of people like Chen Guan Cheng. Human life, euthanasia. If you allow it at the beginning of life, you'll allow it at the end as well. Though I'm glad to say that despite attempts by people to support the promotion of dignitas, which is the <laughs> name that is used for, by those who uh, are trying to give people a lethal injection to kill them, as they do in Holland with the full uh, force of British law, uh, of Dutch law, as they do in Belgium, and indeed as they do uh, in the state of Oregon in the United States as well. What has it led to? In Holland, 4,000 deaths every year, 2,700 of which are in the early stages of dementia, uh, a thousand of which are without the consent of the patient. Once you start it, just like abortion, not hard cases, it ends up then in many cases for the aged. Uh, and it ends up also being promoted um, by people like the philosopher who gave us in Britain experiments on human embryos, Baroness Warnock. This is what she said in the Times newspaper. If you're demented, you're wasting people's lives, your family's lives, and you're wasting the resources of the National Health Service. This kind of mentality is what's leading to the legalization of euthanasia on the back of experiments on human embryos and abortion as well. I'm not making it up. These are her quotes. And this is why the disability rights lobby are so strongly against any change in the law. My colleague, Baroness Campbell, from her wheelchair, spoke movingly in the House and led a demonstration outside of Westminster, not dead yet. Thank God for people like Baroness Jane Campbell. Uh, thank God also for the British Medical Association, who this week, this very week, as soon as while I just arrived in Washington, rejected attempts to 
commit British doctors to supporting an assisted suicide euthanasia agenda. Uh, thank God for our hospice movement. Thank God for the unity of our churches and the different faiths in standing against this. So maybe we have learnt something from our earlier experiences with abortion, and long may that continue. Let me just end, because I know time is against us. I've talked about human rights. I've talked about human life. What about human dignity? The psalmist put it beautifully, for you created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Psalm 139. William Wilberforce, who led the campaign in Britain against slavery, said, we cannot any longer plead ignorance, we cannot turn aside. It was the first parliamentary human rights campaign. It also had a profound effect in the United States of America, and together our two nations ended slavery. We did so because we recognized that every man is made in the image of God. We did so because we believed it was an affront to human dignity. We did so because we believed in the preciousness and the importance of every human life. In our own generation, and I hope they'll be sitting amongst you, people who may be tomorrow's Wilberforces, in our own generation, we need to rouse the conscience of our nations, make a covenant with the world in order that we, in our times, will see the kind of change that the pressure and prayer that was at the centre of Wilberforce's parliamentary campaign will now bring about a new belief in the sacredness, the otherness, the sanctity of human life itself. Thank you for inviting me today.